investment and uh, thus uh, promote economic uh, investment and uh, reduce poverty and increase employment. The, uh, also very important in our countries, some sectors such as in infrastructure, there's a big gap in uh, funding as was pointed out by the director of the World Bank, Sina uh, Gusako, who also referred to the budget of the World Bank and the main focus in human talent. There's estimates that to uh, face uh, this gap, the region would have to invest 4.3% of the annual GDP between 2015 and 2030 to achieve sustainable development in the region, 4.3%. We also learned that these, without these resources, resources it won't be possible without the private sector participation, which requires for governments to strengthen their uh, accountability frameworks, uh, legal frameworks, to generate greater trust from the citizens and obviously uh, from the markets. It's also necessary to advance and improve institutional capacities. Uh, the management of public-private partnerships improve the regulatory framework of the countries and the region as a whole. And these were the main topics. And we can also conclude that this uh, task is of the governments, of the private sector, civil society, as long as we uh, want to advance the region and for it to be more prosperous and transparent. As a personal note, I want to congratulate everyone for what you do. Many times you work with great sacrifice and we know you, the, your role is a very important for the region. So personally, I congratulate you for the uh, work you all do. I know that many times is uh, it's not uh, recognized enough. Also, as a moderator, I would like to highlight and that uh, one of you also presented briefly on the need to have good communication strategies. It's not enough to have excellent work, to have good development policies if this doesn't reach the population. So I believe, and it's uh, hard sometimes, you realize uh, things are not known and a good part of that responsibility is in uh, journalists, uh, but we must make the effort to inform and not things to be left only in Crecer 2019, for instance. And, and it's a good thing that this year we had the opportunity to share with other streamers. I just wanted to highlight that point. And we're going to begin with this important discussion and today to strengthen financial markets and promote investment environment. So the third plenary in this conference, the topic, as you can see in your agendas, are financial systems and information in the digital era. Now we're going to invite the moderator and the panelists. Uh, the uh, plenary will be moderated by Marta Acosta Zuniga, uh, she's a Costa Rican, she's a general comptroller of uh, Costa Rica, and also as a panel member, Juan Miguel La Vista, he's Senior Director, Data Science, Microsoft. Brian Bronier, Director and Chief of uh, Value Bridge Advisors. Roger Park, Leader in Innovations, Financial Services, and Advice of the Americas, FSO. Let's give him a round of applause. So technological, emerging technological innovation is transforming financial services and creating opportunities and challenges for the consumers as well as for service providers and the regulators alike. So this plenary will focus on how innovation in financial uh, services can promote the efficiency in payments, without a doubt, a very interesting topic, very important topic. So now we'll hear the experts. This is Comptroller. The floor is yours. 
Good morning. How are you? And a welcome to our country for those who visit from abroad. I'm sure that you saw how it rains in Costa Rica last night. Uh, I was told it rained two days, what it normally rains in a week. And this panel, as you might have uh, learned, is of great importance. I can affirm that participating in this panel is an interesting opportunity to understand what is happening and as far as financial services in general, where we are going and how finally this can uh, take us to greater efficiency, but also to greater transparency, greater trust, and also to uh, timely decision making. So I invite you to listen uh, with enthusiasm our three panel members whom I'll introduce. Juan Miguel Avista to my right. He will be presenting a high level summary on the ATO science in an organization, the culture of experimenting, as well as uh, key examples of artificial intelligence and its power. Juan Miguel is currently Senior Director of Data Science Microsoft, where he works with a team of data scientists on artificial intelligence, automated learning, and statistical models. He joined Microsoft in 2009 to work in the experimental platform, where he designed a, and controlled experiments. He also worked as part of the uh, data mining in DIN. Juan Miguel is currently the editor of Microsoft a Journal. He has two degrees in engineer of the Catholic uh, University and a postgraduate uh, degree of the John Hopkins University. He's been a presenter in prestigious universities and in multiple countries. Our following panelist, Brian Bernier, He'll be presenting on organizational change, risk management, the future of work and governance in public-private uh, partnerships as uh, new technologies are applied. Brian is the uh, uh, director of analysis, Value Bridge Advisor, and of Bernal Capital of UK, designing what has been called the uh, change that attaches. He uh, He's a data uh, analyst uh, in New York. He has directed initiatives AT and, in AT&T, Nokia, IBM. He directed teams for nine patents in the US, and he led the team that launched the first a, a safe technology product. Uh, he worked in the uh, team that created Risk IT and COVID-5, ISACA. This is the Association of Audit and Control of IT Systems. He drafted a manual on risk management and an operational ma manual, as well as 100 articles, uh, including internal auditor magazine. He obtained his MBA in a business management with multiple honors, University of Michigan. Our third panel member, Roger Park. He'll be sharing what uh, Ernst and Young thinks about the future of consumption of financial services and how a uh, blockchain is used in its services and what uh, he thinks about artificial intelligence. He leads innovation for the practice in advisory in Ernst and Young and the financial services offices for the American content. He's responsible for generating and developing new strategies, services and solutions to help clients respond to the disruptive business drivers in digital transformation and emerging technologies. In this function, Roger accelerates developing new offers and uh, in consultancy, insurance, taxes, and transactions in America. He also supervises the uh, Transfer and Innovation Center of Waste Space. In uh, this firm in New York, he has held a different uh, direction positions in 2008 to relaunch the technological consultancy business. And with this said, Juan Miguel, the floor is yours, but I don't want to uh, leave without saying this distinguished panel we have 
with all this experience and uh, I'm sure it will be very interesting to hear from them. Juan Miguel. Every time we open a newspaper, we find incredible news of, on artificial intelligence and, how, and big data also and how it's changing the world, of course. This is true only partially. There's great exaggeration with this. And there's many words that generate great confusion. The first thing I want to answer today is why we have this need to create so much jargon. And this happens for two reasons. First, because we're addicted to complexity. We like complex things, we like complex projects. That's a reason for which we, uh, we uh, took a man to the moon before adding wheels to uh, suit uh, cases. The second reason is because we want to seem sophisticated and there's nothing better than uh, to seem sophisticated than inventing new words. When you go to Starbucks, instead of small, medium, big, you have to uh, ask for tall, medium, venti. And uh, that's a reason uh, people go to the internet uh, to get these uh, sizes because that's what they use uh, uh, search engines. And uh, this uh, shows our addiction to complexity and this gives way to jargon, and jargon gives way to confusion. What is big data? When you speak about big, big data, what are we talking about? If you go to the big data definition which started in 2001, Doug Laney defined big data as a speed, variety, and volume, uh, three Vs or velocity. And then we went to four Vs, five Vs, and then seven Vs, 10 Vs. So now we're seeing exponential growth of definitions for big data, which starts with a V letter. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it adds, uh, this jargon adds to complexity and confusion. What is big data? Big data is only data. And the only thing important about big data is being able to resolve uh, problems with data. This is the only thing we should be interested about. But we've been resolving problems with data for generations. Uh, just John Snow, he's not the one from Game of Thrones, another John Snow, in 1854, using data from cholera cases in London, he was able to find that the source of this outbreak was the uh, water, public water pumps in the streets. And you can see how people were using data uh, hundreds of years ago. If we want to understand what we refer to when we speak about big data, we must understand what is different now. And some things are different. For instance, it's true, we are generating a giant, huge number of information, but uh, the important thing is not the amount of information, but how cheap it is to gather information. The cell phone nowadays has greater capacity to collect information than what the Hubble had when NASA placed it in orbit in 1990. And besides this, the cost to store this information nowadays is significantly lower. Now, with less than $1,000, we can buy the storage necessary to store all the books that were written in the history of humanity, something that would have cost over a billion dollars in 1987, and something that probably cost less than $100 in a few years. Besides that, the cost to process this information, to process this data nowadays is significantly lower. Uh, now, the Xbox One we use to play games has greater capacity to process data than what a supercomputer had uh, that NCA and the U.S. government purchased in 99, which cost six to seven million dollars. And today we use this to play the NVIDIA cards, which are the ones we use to uh, train algorithms that now cost $3,000, have three times the capacity to process data than what the uh, uh, supercomputer had that through 2004 was the super, uh, fastest supercomputer in uh, human history and that had a price of $700 million. And now anyone who has access to $3,000 has three times the capacity the Japanese government had back then. So when we speak about big data, we must understand it's only data. But uh, the fact that it's very cheap today to collect and save and store this information and process makes it uh, have more, many opportunities that in the past weren't possible. What is artificial intelligence? Well, what are we talking about with artificial intelligence? Well, part of the problem with AI is part of this jargon or this marketing. But the great majority of times when we speak about artificial intelligence, we're talking about uh, machine learning algorithms. And what's a machine, machine learning algorithm? Well, these are algorithms that learn to generalize based on data. 
What does this mean? Imagine we have a bank, and in this bank, we want to be able to automate the, uh, the uh, loan approval process. So what we want to know is if the person who is uh, applying for a loan will pay or not repay that loan. So let's imagine we have the information here in green. Uh, we have the uh, historical for loans of the bank. In green are these loans that were repaid. And in red are uh, payments that uh, where the individuals defaulted. Given this information, and the criteria we're using to know if a person is going to repay or not, the only thing an uh, AI algorithm does is to find the function. It's to find a function that could separate the world in two, and those who will repay and those who will not repay. And this is the only thing algorithms do in machine learning. This is the only thing artificial intelligence does. It's all math. And this has a huge power, because the only thing I need to be able to resolve a problem is data and a success criteria. This is the power that artificial intelligence has. And for you to have an idea, in the 90s, there was many companies that wanted to resolve the uh, automatic uh, character recognition. I have a check from a bank, for instance, and I want to know exactly what's the number on it. So being able to recognize a human written uh, characters. In the 90s, uh, companies invested in millions of hours of uh, software programming to resolve this issue. And the companies that were able to resolve it uh, were sold in hundreds of millions of dollars. Nowadays, any person in the world who has access to a database, and you can download it from the internet for these characters using these algorithms, can resolve this issue in those six uh, code lines. This is the power of artificial intelligence. And all of those are very different problems uh, to what we saw uh, to detecting cancer based on pathology tests. Uh, from the machine learning point of view, these problems are the same. We have images, we have data, and what we find is a difference between patients who have cancer and those who don't. That's, this is the power of artificial intelligence. Although this has a huge power, we must understand that there are problems and we must understand these limitations before we're able to use these algorithms. So let's review some lessons learned in this regard. The first one, we cannot be deceived by the bias. Let me show you what I uh, call the dilemma people who write with the left hand. There's no bias against people who write uh, with the left, left-handed left people. Uh, the distribution of people, uh, left-handed people is the same as the distribution of people who write with the left hand, left-handed in the world. 10% of you are left-handed. Raise your hand if you are left-handed. It works. And unfortunately, I have bad news for you, those left-handed uh, people. In 1991, Two researchers from California State University and British Columbia University uh, published the following paper. They took a group of people who had died, who were left-handed, and asked their relatives if uh, they uh, were left-handed or right-handed. It was a random group of people who died, and they asked their parent, uh, relatives if they were left or right-handed. And those who were left-handed died nine years before right-handed uh, people. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the most, one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world. And it was quoted and, uh, by many other researchers in the world. It was, it was even published in the New York Times. And if this was true, writing with the left hand would be as bad uh, as uh, smoking 120 cigarettes per day. Very bad. The good news is what the researchers didn't account for is that for many years there was certain discrimination against the left-handed people and the parents would force their kids to write with the right hand. I know this because my grandfather was forced 
to ride with his right hand. Unfortunately, people stopped doing this, and this generated an artificial increase of people who ride with the left hand in the world. It's an artificial increase that gives us and makes us think that those who ride with the left hand die before. What's the problem with this in machine learning or artificial intelligence? Imagine we have a life insurance company that uh, issues uh, life insurance policies, and if the person says if they're left-handed or not, if we have a machine learning system, the system will tell uh, uh, that it will say that the left-handed uh, people have to be charged more. So the lesson here is if we have a lot of data we collect has statistical bias and if we don't understand this bias the machine learning or artificial intelligence algorithms will have problems the second thing is that we cannot be deceived by a uh, randomness uh, uh, ronald uh, cole said if you torture the data long enough it will confess so if we torture data as it says it will confess what he was saying is uh, what happened to a sports uh, 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 journalist in the 70s. His name was uh, Leonard Coppett. He learned that uh, there was a perfect correlation between the Super Bowl winner and what happened with the uh, U.S. stock market. If an uh, IFC uh, team won, the stock would increase and uh, otherwise, an AFC, uh, it would uh, lower the market. The correlation back then was perfect. If we make a statistical test, we'll see that this, this is statistically significant. This means that we must think that the Super Bowl has some predictive power with what happens in the stock market. Of course not. Uh, but what's the secret here? Well, the secret is that there's millions of time series. Finding one that is correlates to a uh, score is quite uh, easy. There's no value in these uh, correlationships. To, uh, as an example, I took the country risk of Latin American bonds, and I compared this information with all the time series we have in Microsoft of what people uh, search in internet and what is uh, related to the country risk in Latin America. Well, people searching Merrill Boots in internet. It has a quite good uh, correlationship with what happens uh, with the score. Uh, if we have a lot of data, we'll probably find things that just uh, happen to correlate. There's no real value in this correlationship, just people making mistakes. And despite that over 40 years, Len Leonard Copet uh, invented the Super Bowl indicator, it's still in the press almost every day, almost every year. Every time a Super Bowl team wins, they speak about the Super Bowl indicator and what's happening with the score. We must uh, remember that correlation does not imply causation. This is another problem we have. If we see the people, uh, or ice cream sales, and people who drown, they're highly correlated. And different from what happened previously, this correlation does not happen by uh, coincidence. It happens because both time series depend on the other one, which is temperature. When it's hotter, there's more ice cream sales, more people go to the, the beach, there's a greater probability of people drowning. This means that I could use, in theory, the use of ice cream uh, the sale of ice cream to predict people who drown, and this correlationship works. It doesn't mean if, if I prohibit uh, ice cream sales uh, that this correlation will stop existing. The problem is that most people don't understand this. Gallup uh, made a survey a few years ago where it asked a very simple question. Do you think the correlation implies causation? 64% of Americans responded yes, 28 said no, and 8% were undecided. Uh, I'm not uh, worried about those undecided. I'm worried because 64% of the people think that the correlation implies causation. And why does this happen? Well, because human brain learns from correlation. We cannot observe causality, but we can learn from correlations. When you're in an elevator and you want the door to close, you press S button or that button. Uh, sorry, and last year they made a study where they said that most of these buttons don't work, but the human brain thinks it works. We press the button and the door closes in the elevator, right? But it would have closed anyway. 
Uh, what do we learn from correlation once again? And this is so common, we see it in the press almost every day. Uh, friends in Hugo Malion, uh, they made a study where they found a relationship between uh, the cost of your marriage and the duration or the probability of divorce. The more you spend in your marriage, you have greater probability of getting a divorce. And pay attention here. And the paper, they say that they don't, don't imply causation. The only thing they're implying is that there's a correlation and there is predictive power. What does CNN say? You want a happy marriage? Uh, have a big uh, but cheap uh, marriage. This is the same as saying that to reduce the amount of people who drown, we must uh, diminish the amount of ice cream sales. And CNN was not the only one. The cheaper the wedding, the, the more longer the marriage, the cost of wedding isn't happy uh, marriage. The only initiator uh, spoke good about this news was Wall Street. Uh, they said, will cheap helping marriage help? Correlation in marriage. We must understand that correlation does not imply causation, and more importantly, that most people don't understand the difference. And finally, we'll speak about that will deceive the system. And what does this mean? Well, this is called the cobra effect. And the cobra effect comes from the uh, British colony in India, where the British were very concerned about the amount of people who were uh, bit by cobras. So to reduce cobra bites, uh, what they started doing is they started paying for dead cobras. At the beginning of this work, the amount of people uh, who were bit by cobras started dropping. What would happen at the end? Well, it became a business. People started breeding cobras. So the amount of cobra bites started increasing, and the government learned there was companies that were doing this, breeding cobras, and they said, no more, we won't pay anymore. And what did the companies do? They started letting go cobras, generating a much greater problem than th what they had in the past. And this continues happening today, because people deceive the system. They trick the system. There's a bar in Seattle, where I come from, and what they did, they wanted, they wanted to uh, promote for people going, uh, taking their bicycle to the bar, and they would be part of the happy hour. It worked at the beginning, they just had to show they had a helmet. But what happened? People started going in their car with a helmet. So we're tricking the system. It's very easy to trick say, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, systems. So the relationship between data and result is not causal, and there are incentives, then we might have the risk user wanting to game the system. It's very easy to game artificial intelligence as a, a human being, the future. Bill Clinton said intelligence, capacity, and willingness to work are distributed evenly throughout the world, but opportunities are not. The reason for which I'm optimistic about the future is uh, because of opportunities. The first one is the opportunity to learn. Sebastian Trun and Peter Norvig, who are what is considered the best artificial intelligence professionals in the world, who now give this course in Stanford, they experimented, an uh, incredible experiment a few years ago, and the course they gave in Stanford, they opened massively to any student in the world who had access to internet. And this was a great opportunity. And over 160,000 students all over the world enrolled in this course uh, from 190 countries from Afghanistan to Colombia. And the incredible thing about this is that when they finished this course, they uh, had their test and the top 400 students, none of them were from Stanford. And what this shows is that there's a number of people in the world that if you provide the opportunity to learn, they can learn this technology and apply it. These uh, kids would have never been able to get into Stanford. And it would have taken them over two, uh, 200 years to give this course, and they did it in six months. And uh, nowadays, uh, thanks to many companies, the best courses for this technology is open, and anyone in the world who has access to internet can now learn these courses. And the second thing is to have the opportunity to uh, process data, opportunity to one computer. When I was a child, uh, my parents were able to buy a computer, and it was thanks to that that was, uh, I learned to program. But I was the only one of uh, my uh, classmates. Now in Uruguay, everyone with this uh, 
plan, although it's a small computer, it has more uh, data processing power than many uh, computers in the U.S. government had in the 80s, and there was the opportunity to have access to data. And now, thanks to programs as open data, governments and institutions are allowing uh, people to use this data, and this is opening uh, an array of opportunities, and the last thing is the difference to make an op the opportunity to make a difference. Uh, Jeffrey Homerecker, he once said, "The best minds of my generation are thinking about how to make people click on ads, and that sucks." Is what he said. But nowadays, there are many organizations who are dedicating this type of uh, applying artificial intelligence to uh, severe problems. Thirty percent of the food in the world is lost before people even can buy it, and this is a problem. If you analyze why these things happen, it's because many of these organizations in the value chain have to predict how much food uh, will be consumed and how much food they'll be able to sell. The artificial intelligence algorithms can solve this type of problems. In your phones, you have more capacity than what the world had when a man uh, went to the moon. We have the data, we have the processors, we, we don't have any more excuses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juan Miguel. In addition to learning that it is possible that I might live nine years less in average, we have also learned that big data and AI generate many opportunities to be more efficient. Thank you very much. Now we'll give the floor over to Roger. Thank you very much. I really loved Juan's presentation. I thought I was uh, lucky because I'm not left-handed but now I realize I have to get a divorce because my wedding costs too much. So I'll be calling my wife right after this. Um, thank you for having me today. I'd like to present a little bit on Ernst & Young's perspective on accelerating innovation. Uh, and I start this presentation with a cautionary story. I'm sure you've all heard about Kodak. I'm sure you have. Uh, a lot of presentations about innovation start with Kodak because um, there's a lot to learn from that story. They'll be teaching the Kodak story case study for years, decades in business school. Uh, in 1996, their market cap was 28 billion. They had close to 90% market share, 140,000 employees, the best company in the world for making film. By 2012, they had gone bankrupt. Lots of things happen. Like I said, there's lots of lessons to be learned here. But the one I want to highlight for the conversation today is that Kodak did not go out of business because they were bad at making film. In fact, until they went bankrupt, they were probably the best in the world at making film. Their board, their executive management team, all of their employees were the best in, at, at uh, making film and being in the film business. But looking back at it now, what do we know? Kodak really wasn't in the film business, were they? People weren't buying film to stockpile film and had no inherent value. People were buying film to capture and share experiences. And as soon as companies like Instagram and others use newer technologies to help people capture and share experiences, they didn't just put Kodak out of business. They made the entire film industry irrelevant. Nobody makes film anymore. So the lesson to be learned, I think, for the purposes of talking about accelerating innovation is Kodak was so focused on producing what they thought they were good at producing, they lost sight of the value that they were actually creating for their customers and for the market. And so that's the lesson we should learn. Now, when we talk about innovation, it can mean a lot of things. How many of you are sick, about, sick of hearing about innovation? I hear about it all the time. It's OK. You can raise your hand. Um, but innovation can mean a lot of things. It's not just emerging technologies, though. In my perspective, innovation is just finding new ways to create value, doing something new. New products, new services, new ways of working, new ways of managing risk, new ways of motivating your talent, new ways of allocating your capital. All of those things are innovation. But you might say, we're already doing that, Roger. What's changed? Why is innovation in the newspaper all the time? Why are we talking about it so much? Back to Juan's presentation, the incredible pace of technological change is amplifying everything that we're doing. 
we have unprecedented levels of geopolitical uncertainty, macroeconomic volatility, the demographic changes that we're seeing. Uh, for example, in the U.S., 35% of our workforce in the U.S. I'm from New York is millennials. 72% of EY's workforce is millennials. So we have it either twice as good or twice as bad, depending on how you look at that. I think we have it twice as good. Um, but that's changing everything, not just because it's a new generation, but because it's the first generation that grew up always connected to the internet. That changes the relationship you have with information, that changes the relationship you have with brands and companies you work with, and that changes the way that you think about how you relate to each other. All of that has changed. That requires innovation. Um, the types of risks that we have to manage. I ask this question a lot. How many of you think that financial risk is a, is a board level issue for, for companies and organizations? Probably everybody, hopefully. How many of you think that cybersecurity risk is a board level issue? Yeah, yeah, certainly is now. Maybe not 10 years ago, right? How many of you would consider social media risk a board level issue? Yeah, a few hands. I think we'll see more hands going forward. Did, have you seen the uh, YouTube video? There was a gentleman who was dragged off of a United Airlines flight in Chicago. Have you seen that video? And then he crawled back on, he was beaten up a little bit. He happened to be a doctor. Remember that video? That cost United Airlines $1.4 billion of market cap in 48 hours. At that time, that was about 10% of United Airlines market cap. If there is an event risk that can impact your organization that dramatically, that's a board level issue. Now the question is, what do you have to do new in order to respond to that type of risk? Right. And last but not least, we talk a lot about emerging technologies and the pace of technological change. Juan mentioned big data. Um, I think the amount of data that's being generated actually will have a bigger impact, a more dramatic impact on our, uh, on our businesses and our organizations and the countries that we operate in. You've probably heard this statistic. 90% of all data ever created by human beings, ever, in the history of humanity, was created in the last two years. Have you heard that statistic? Yeah, that's a mind-blowing statistic, I think. More mind-blowing is that that's not a spike, right? It's not like 20, 2018 was a really good year for data and now we're back to normal, no. That's not what that means. It means that every two years, the amount of data that we have increases by 10 times. And you think about how you can marry that amount of data with analytics and cognitive technologies like AI and others, that is going to fundamentally change and should fundamentally change how we all make decisions as individuals and as organizations. So what are we going to have to do new in response to that? I, I, uh, I'll ask you a question. I'll ask you all a favor. Raise your hand if you would have gotten into a self-driving car 10 years ago. Nobody? Not very safe 10 years ago, right? How many of you would get into a self-driving car today? A few, a few people? Usually see about a third to a half now. The self-driving car actually, at least in the US, is the safest car on the road. It is much safer than a human-driven car today. Think about 10 years from now, with the increase in the amount of data that's available, the power of technology and AI and computing, those cars are gonna be the safest cars on the road by orders of magnitude. Think about this. How many of you would feel comfortable letting your children or your family get into a, a human-driven car 10 years from now? No, right? I'm not comfortable letting my kids get into a human-driven car today sometimes. But this is the inflection point that we're on. Between now and 10 years from now, we're gonna see a transformation across all industries driven by this emerging technology, the amount of data that's available, and the power of AI. 10 years from now, are you gonna trust a doctor's diagnosis if they don't believe in the internet? They're just gonna base it on their school learning? Are you gonna take advice from a financial advisor if they're just doing it based on their gut? their instinct, versus using the latest data sets and algorithms available. That transformation is going to hit every single industry, and financial services in particular is going to be hit pretty hard. So what we're starting to see is in response to all this disruption, and this is across financial services but all industries are, as well, it's no longer a tenable strategy to create a separate transformation program. 
we, we hear about digital transformation, we hear about automation transformation, we hear about a lot of transformations going on, but in the past, a major business transformation that impacted your industry would maybe take 10 to 15 years. And if you were a CEO or president uh, uh, or a leader of an organization, maybe you would see one or two major transformations in your industry. Now it's constant. We don't have 10 to 15 years to respond to disruption anymore. And it's not one disruption at a time. Before the ink is dry on your digital transformation plan, you need an automation plan. While you're working on that strategy, you need to incorporate AI. How do you leverage your big data infrastructure? Should that be deployed to the cloud? Are blockchain technologies relevant? Is quantum computing going to make blockchain irrelevant? So it's not one disruption at a time, and they're all stacked on top of each other, but they're all interconnected, which increases the complexity of this. So the approach that we'll set up a team to figure out how to transform our business, let them work on it for a few years and come back and fix it, that doesn't work anymore. What we're starting to see uh, across our client base is the idea that we ha now have to be continuously transforming our organizations all the time. We have to be in a sustainable state of continuous transformation. And that takes different operating models, that takes different risk management procedures, that takes different leadership, and that takes different talent. So we're seeing that transition happening. It has a lot of implications. So one of the things that we're seeing uh, is that when we talk about digital transformation, it can mean a lot of things. Uh, in a lot of cases, it starts from talk, discussing the digitization of the experience. Online, mobile, social, chatbots, and then soon our chatbots will be talking to each other while we're all having coffee, which will be nice. Um, but ultimately, what this is about is being able to maintain a real-time, one-on-one conversation with every single one of your stakeholders. Could be your customers, could be your employees, could be your investors, could be your regulators, whoever it may be. And those conversations have to be highly relevant in order to get above the noise. People don't want choices anymore. I don't want choices. What I want are the organizations that I work with to know me well enough to give me exactly what I want when I want it. And if they can do that in a reliable, trustworthy way, those are two very important words, if they can provide that service in a reliable, trustworthy way, then I will give them access to my data, which ultimately, in this world, means access to my life. So these are the new relationships that digital organizations are going to be having with all of their stakeholders. But setting that expectation with that experience and not being able to fulfill it is making a promise that you can't keep. So in order to be able to respond to what you're seeing now in the marketplace and the organizations out there in, in, in your workforce, you have to be a much more agile, flexible organization. You need to take these large-grained business services or services that have really been designed around efficiencies of scale and break them, out, break them down into smaller component services that can be reconfigured on the fly to adapt to every single conversation you're having with every single one of your stakeholders. Traditional operating models, in that sense, don't work. Silos don't work. Processes have to be automated. Manual processes, not only they're inefficient, it's very risky to try to change manual processes that fast. You're going to have to manage talent in different ways. You're going to be measuring performance in different ways and reporting on that performance in different ways. And you're going to be managing a whole different ecosystem or constellation of risks. So this is a significant change for most organizations particularly in financial services. But let's assume that this all happens. We'll figure it all out. Can you run this agile organization, very flexible business model that's engaged with every single one of your stakeholders real time? Can you run that on legacy infrastructure? Probably not. We're all going to have to move to the cloud, use big data infrastructure, imply, implement analytics, AI, maybe blockchain for key data elements, et cetera. So we're going to have to digitize our infrastructure as well. But that's just technology infrastructure. When we're talking about big organizations, what about the other infrastructure we need to run the organization, like financial management, risk management, HR? And when we're talking to our business clients, what about their tax infrastructure? Three years ago, I was speaking with one of my clients at a big bank, CFO of a big bank, about digital transformation. And she asked me, Roger, 
how do I deliver my financial reports on mobile and social? How do I get better data visualization in those reports so my executives can make better decisions? And I would call that a very good project. That's a good project for digitizing finance. But today, when I meet with that CFO about digital, her questions to me are, what's the right way to do cost allocation of cloud services back to the business? Because we need to incent adoption. How do I change my annual budgeting and forecasting process? Because my product development teams have compressed that from 18 months down to 12 weeks. So there's a very subtle but important shift in the conversation that we're having in this industry from how do we digitize finance, how do we digitize risk, how do we digitize tax, to how do we manage finance, manage risk, manage tax, manage HR in a digital organization. So this is gonna happen, the end-to-end -end digital transformation. Nothing can stop it now. We're already seeing it. But is that the winning strategy? Not for most of the companies and organizations I work with. Those are gonna be table stakes. Right? The winning strategy is what it's always been, which is the data. Turning all the data that you're unlocking as a digital organization, and that's a massive amount of data, turning that data into better insights using the latest analytics or cognitive technologies, taking those insights, delivering them back into your organization real time to a point of decision where you can take action on that insight to improve the experience or optimize your operations or manage your infrastructure more effectively and efficiently. If you can do that, you're gonna win because that is an overwhelming competitive advantage. Maybe not even real time, with the technologies available today, you can do that in a predictive manner. So my question is, if you're an organization, how fast can you become more digital? And it's not an easy proposition, especially for a lot of our large incumbent financial services institutions. But I think if we can't solve that problem, we have a bigger problem to solve, which is if you can't become more digital, how do you compete with the organizations that can? How many of you think it's gonna take less than 10 years to get to this digital transformation across industries? Less than 10? Less than five? How many of you think there are companies that already operate like this at scale? The competition is already here. The other thing that we're seeing, talking to a lot of our, our clients about, is just in, uh, the plethora of new technologies that we now have to be fluent in. Digital, artificial intelligence, process automation, RPA, robotic process automation, next-gen data or big data, cloud transformation, cybersecurity, fintech, just in general, blockchain. We can add to this list quantum computing, Internet of Things, drones, 3D printing. This list of technology will never be shorter than it is today, and it's never been longer than it has been in the past. So how do we react and respond to this? There's two ways we can do that. One of them is to take a very defensive posture. What should I do about digital? What should I do about blockchain? How do I respond to or react to the threat of quantum computing? And there's certainly a lot of discussion about that and a lot of energy being put into how do we react and respond. The other way to handle this is to say, this is the new normal. There are always gonna be new technologies that are gonna potentially disrupt or change the way that we operate. How can we use these technologies in combination to create new platforms that enable new operating models, which in turn enable new business models? How can we design our organizations to run reliably and efficiently and effectively on platforms that are constantly incorporating new technologies? Because we're moving from an era where the winning strategy was industrializing for efficiency and here's the good news, we all won, because if we're still around, we're probably very efficient than companies that were around 30, 40 years ago. But now that's not gonna be enough. Now we also have to industrialize for innovation. How do you unlock the innovation, new idea creation, new value creation in every part of your organization continuously? And enable that to impact your business and transform your business in a very safe, efficient environment. Efficient because we're going to do a lot of it. And the more efficiently you can do this, the more competitive you will be. 
safely because by definition, we have to try a lot of things that we're not sure are gonna work, so we're gonna make a lot of mistakes. But if you can't industrialize for efficient, uh, innovation going forward, once again, you're gonna be falling behind the companies that can. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Next up is Brent. He said since the beginning of his presentation, he gave us an idea that is important, that innovation creates value. If our companies and institutions do not create value for our citizens, our consumers, our clients, we have to they do an in-depth review. So we have to generate value. And innovation is a means to do it. Thank you very much. Now, Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you and good morning. The, uh, as we've gone through the presentations here, Juan has shared with us the excitement of the technology and he closed a little bit with the challenges and the opportunities we have. And then Roger came and sort of walked through sort of the, the process view of innovation and uh, again challenged us at the end that these things are real and these are, are possible and doable. You know, Juan got all the exciting technology stuff that Roger and I didn't get, but I must tell you from up here, Roger's got the most exciting socks. <laughs> So, um, uh, I love origin stories. Where did things come from? Last night we went to the event and we heard origin stories of Costa Rica. And, uh, and we, we have this you know, wonderful building right on, the, on our highlights. But here's another building. I wonder if some of you know this. Anybody know what city this is in? Anybody at all? It's New York. Any fans of like, uh, you know, films, right? I mean, if you saw the Avengers, Thor was on the top of this building. I mean, the, um, and, but what I'd like to draw your attention to is the part about halfway down. It's, this is the Chrysler building, and it has the Chrysler Eagles mounted on it. And in the top portion of that building, this building was built in 1928, where the offices of Pan American Airways, created by Juan Tripp. Now, Juan Tripp was faced with an opportunity, and he had a challenge. Aviation was new in 1928. And he had this vision of connecting North and South America together. But how to do it? There were no runways. There were no weather stations. There was no radio. So on the back of a Postal Service contract, he innovated. And then he brought in a radio expert in 1928 when they began service to Latin America, first to the Caribbean islands, then it expanded. But then they had a problem. Look at the storms that come through here in Costa Rica, how to communicate weather information. So we had to build the infrastructure of weather stations. And then he didn't have runways, so he had flying boats. This is a picture I took inside the Marine Air Terminal at LaGuardia Airport, built in 1939. You can go to Google Maps and look at LaGuardia Airport and still see the dock from where the flying boats came in. That helped him overcome this issue of lack of runways. And then he had another innovation, because he couldn't fly all these distances. The planes had to stop, and when the planes had to stop, the people had to stop, and had to be fueled and watered and fed. And he needed this idea of a hotel. And so, in 1946, he created a hotel chain to serve his clients coming to Latin America and by then the Pacific. Anybody have any idea what hotel chain that was? You're in it. Intercontinental, created by Juan Tripp. All right, the origin story, where did it come from? A man with a practical problem, the hotel we're in today, came because the planes could only fly so far. And they needed to stop for fuel and water and food. And that's how we got to where we are today. People solving practical problems. So when Juan talks about Hubble and the advancements we made, and, and Roger talks about how we've got to look at this kinds of disruption or the change we're going on, this is something that's been around for a while, and we're dealing with it. Today, this is what we get, right? This is because of one trip in an office in a building that opened in 1928 with a vision to connect North and South America together. And now we have this. 
Now, there's all these origin stories of amazing things that happen to the world. The father of plastics, Charles Bakelite, in 1907 created, or Bakelin created Bakelite, which created the plastic industry. And like Juan and Roger talked about, people were experimenting with plastic because they would make plastic and it would get all droopy and melty in the summer. Well, he had an idea. Everybody was looking at different ways, and he systematically experimented and realized that at high pressure and high temperature, he could put a couple chemicals together and make a stable plastic because he went against the grain. He did what everybody else said couldn't be done, and he did it in 1907. And look at all the plastic we've got sitting with us in the room today. Right? Or take something else that's out there. FM radio, Charles Armstrong, also in New York City. People said that he couldn't do it. RCA, who championed AM radio, actively worked to block him. And yet, he produced FM radio. And as a child, he built a tower outside Yonkers, New York, which was an eyesore, and nobody wanted it, and they couldn't afford the money to tear it down. But on one day, the fateful December 11th, all of a sudden that became valuable because when the Twin Towers fell and everybody needed a place to put the towers, they put it on top the tower that Charles Armstrong and his father built by hand because it was the highest point built on a rock over the Hudson River. So there's origin stories behind these. And these are all things that the, the point of this discussion is that you can do this because it has already been done. Adjusting to the change that's in the world. Harold Evans wrote the book, They Made America. The stories I'm giving you are from that. We talk about factories and how factories are becoming more automated and displacing people. Do you know when the first one of those factories was? The first factory. Think about that for a moment. I'll give you the answer in just a minute. But I'm going to give you one other answer or one other story from Charles, um, Harold Evans' book. We have more than a few women in this room. I'm told that in Latin America, females rock in finance. And all of you are wearing ladies' undergarments. They came from one woman, Ida Cohen Rosenthal, a Russian immigrant who, because she didn't speak English when she came in, was trying to pronounce the name of this undergarment with a Russian accent that she invented, she and her husband William invented. And that's where we have the word in English, brassiere from her Russian accent. And in 1928, the same year that the Chrysler building was built in Pan Am started Airways, she hit a milestone. A half a million women's bras sold in 1928. That was an innovation. So look at all the things that are happening that we're doing with technology, and yet we have these earlier technologies that have come together and made things different. And they're all collected together in this book, and there's so much great stuff in there. But when you distill all of it, it comes down to this process. And that is we have to think about a problem. We need to deeply understand it and what was going on. How does it work? Juan and Roger have both already teed that up. Then we need to bring together some technology. And I have a child seesaw or teeter-totter because it represents a lever. And levers are four of the seven basic mechanical tools. So we have to find some piece of technology, and that's been going on for 2,000 years. And then we need to tinker and test, play with it, see how it works. Roger talked about his innovation center, where they tinker and test and put things together. And we do this very quickly and very fast. And again, this is not new to today. Today it's digital. But it's an issue that existed before in 1907 with plastics and in airplanes and all sorts of things. And then we need to look at how do we triumph with this, this is a friend of mine's race car, and how we keep going. The pace always goes on that, that Juan and Roger both mentioned. Because in racing, in sports, you're only as good as your last victory, right? How quickly does a player fall out of favor? How quickly does a team fall out of flavor? Unless they're continuously innovating. And this cycle goes over and over and over again. Now, you may think this is difficult, and wow, we've got to invent it, and I'm not sure how to go about doing this, but here's the good news. It's already been assembled for you. This man, Merle Crawford, he's the godfather of the discipline of product management. He created this over 40 years ago, the New Products Management Association. He co-founded the first journal, like Juan writes for a journal. He founded. The Crawford Fellowship is named in his honor, and he's put this together in a package that's used all over. 
in consumer products companies and auto companies and almost anything people can buy, except oddly enough for technology, where they have not yet discovered all of his methods because you don't get product management in a software development class. But he developed this and it's out there and it's available for you. Now, if you don't want to read the whole book, he worked with me on a chapter of my book to sort of slim it down and provide a, a one chapter summary of it. But Merle Crawford created this, and also with product management, he created this important notion we were talking about at dinner last night that today we call fake innovation, right? When you do fake innovation, it's like um, Juan was talking about buzzwords and AI. It's, oh, we're going to call this new, but it's really not, right? We've seen that, like in, you know, soap powder. Oh, it's new. It's got bleach. It's got borax. It's got brighteners. But it's really not. And in corporations today, too often, the way we get a project approved, or government, is we say, it's new, put a big stamp on it, and now let's go do it. But it really has the same underlying flaws. As managers, as financial professionals, as auditors sitting in this audience, that is your role and your opportunity to be able to see, is the decision process we're using missing the real value creation? And to ask these probing types of questions. So don't do fake innovation, do real innovation as they've discussed. Now, Merle and I went and distilled this into five steps. The first one is to evaluate your enterprise and the environment that's operating around you. The second one is to seek scenarios. It's called asking what if or asking why. The third one is to watch for warning signs of things that are changing, whether it's technological change or it's some sort of operational risk in your project that you're doing. Those are the evaluation stages. And then we do things. We prioritize what's going to provide us the biggest benefit. Our distinguished chair last night, when you made your remarks, you talked about how do we pick the right things. This is important, yesterday morning, I should say. So this is the important thing that we're trying to get out of this conference, how to prioritize on those things that add value more quickly and easily. And then we want to be able to do it. And when we're doing it, we're improving our position in our environment and in our own organization. That's what we talk about capacity building here with the World Bank and the American Development Bank. And it all comes together, and the loop runs over and over and over and over again. And when something bad happens, we have to react to it, and we recover from it and just move on. But this loop is fundamental and basic. And if this loop looks familiar to you, we actually adapted it from a gentleman by the name of W. Edwards Deming. And he adapted it from a gentleman by the name of Walter Schuert at Bell Labs way back in 1934. This is not new. It's been done. You can do it, too more easily than you might think. Now, 1928 was another important year because in the world of economics, there is a very important paper written. Now, this is a picture of a Ford Motor Company plant in the United Kingdom in 1928. And if you want to send me an email, I can even send you a video to this. But what do you think you're going to see in a manufacturing plant in 1928? Lots of people. Even on a Ford assembly line, a modern advance, lots of people. This is a picture of the BMW plant in Spartanburg. Or I could show you the Ford Rouge plant in Dearborn, Michigan. What do you think you see today in an automobile manufacturing plant? Robots, robots, robots. You can go online, you can see these videos from all kinds of manufacturers. They're set to symphony music, and at the end, the robots clap for what a great job they did, right? That's changed the world. We've seen it happen in agriculture, right? Agriculture or food shortages are not an agricultural problem. They're a political problem, right? Manufacturing, we've changed dramatically, as we see in these pictures here. And infrastructure that we talked about yesterday morning, that's the same way. I mean, you think about how quickly the price of infrastructure has dropped like a rock. General Electric is in huge financial trouble because the cost of their power generation uh, products have dropped like a rock. Infrastructure is so incredibly cheap. What drives up infrastructure, whether it's in Latin America or New York City, that's a political problem, right? So the closing this infrastructure gap, it's not a technical challenge. That was solved years ago. It's a political challenge to bring together people thinking through a decision process. And that's why we want to emphasize that these, this level of change is a threat to existence of your jobs and to the stability of countries. We're seeing it around the world in elections. We've got the EU voting this week. This is a plant that's not far from my house. I drive past it every Sunday morning on the way home from church. But look at the date, 1919, 100 years ago, built at the industrial height of the state of Connecticut between right after World War I. And now it's in shambles. 
right? Debbie and I are from the state of Michigan. The Ford Rouge plant, even during the Great Depression, employed 100,000 people. There are 6,000 people there now. That's a huge shock to any economy. It's a threat to your existence. What are you going to do about it? What action are you going to take out of this meeting to make a difference? 1928 was an important year for another reason. 1928 was the year my father was born. And next week will be five years since he died. And he died because he had an undetected lung cancer. Juan and Roger both talked about the detection, especially Juan. Within a month of when he died, there was a new test to do early lung de cancer detection. You breathe into a straw and it analyzes the breath and it tells you if you've got very early lung cancer. Within a year, there was a gene splicing project underway. This is the um, robot from Intuitive Surgical that's designed to go deep into the bronchial passages of the lungs to do biopsies and, and to treat lung cancer that are down there. This is all out and it's available and it's a huge change. But we go from 1928, all those massive changes that were just shocking people's lives to the changes that are here now, and in some ways, it's not that different. The challenge was handled 100 years ago, 90 years ago, 80 years ago, and you can do it too with the techniques that are out there. All right, we're in Costa Rica. For those of you that are from Costa Rica, you might know you visit Newark, New Jersey frequently. And in Newark, New Jersey, we've got a big... Uh, Costa Rican population, and a few miles away from that is the Zahn Center for Innovation. And the Zahn Center for Innovation, we've got students doing amazing projects. This is from two weeks ago. When they come into university, they get degrees, they start businesses, and they make huge changes. Some of these may be your children. They can teach you. These children are now learning what was a PhD PhD level piece of work in artificial intelligence three years ago is a high school level project today. At breakfast we were talking about Roger's kids and Juan's kids out there coding when they're in third and fourth grade. So you can mentor these people in understanding the business, they can understanding you in coding. And here's a rule of thumb. If your job today is dependent on somebody that can go to Coursera and get a one week certificate, your job is gone. Right? not to mention the two-year program. So these are easy to learn, quick to learn, and you can bring into place and make them happen. And as managers, again, this is where I said we've got to overcome structural blindness and cognitive bias, right? Because when we fall victim to these, our brains trick us into doing really bad things. A fundamental role of managers is to avoid that when you're doing projects. So not to think we can't do this and fall into all kinds of depression and despair, but to say no, it's been done before and to encourage your teams to take action now to make a difference. This is the winning team in one of the competitions last um, uh, two weeks ago tomorrow. They have a boxing game, but there's all these other things that are out there. These are people that are coming from countries around the world, getting their degrees and going back and changing things. And the point is, this is so easy to do. The center that Roger has that he was referring to is an adult version of this. It's like playtime when you go into this thing. We met there last Tuesday, right? And Microsoft has got an office over on Times Square that I've been to. Right? This is playtime. This should be fun. But you have to take immediate action to do this. So this is my sort of closing thought to you and with a story. Who have you met here? Has everybody at each table traded business cards with everybody? What did you do last night at your dinner table? Who have you met that's new? Zana is here someplace. She's been gluing together this whole conference. Debbie introduced me to Antonio, wherever Antonio is. Antonio introduces me to Zana. I talk with Zana. She's from Kosovo. One of my graduate students is from Kosovo. I've already introduced them and connected them. Right? We can make connections to change the world and do things differently. A woman I know through the Zan Center, she's from India, worked for the World Bank, then worked for a consulting firm. Now she's at a fintech firm, and she's deep into making change. She's a, a woman managing a team of eight guys doing dramatic things in uh, cyber strategy. She took projects that were three years overdue and delivered them in six months. She cut her own budget by 20%, right? Because she had the drive to work with an international team of interdisciplinary people. She is now so in demand that she spoke at Harvard last week Somebody from MIT was involved with the Harvard planning. MIT said, will you speak at our program the very next day? 
Next week, she's out at, in Colorado at the premier uh, global women's empowerment event called Global Minded, where she's leading their Young International Leaders Council. But what she does is every single day, she's connecting somebody. And she's not just giving advice, she's not just mentoring, she's sponsoring. How can you take some young person, like the, the future children of, of Juan and Roger, and take that person to a new level? We talked within Debbie's world and Carol Sai about every Auditor General should be running an incubator, right? To both save your own resources, but to help develop a capacity in your country and train and learn. So my, my closing comment here is, think about the people you're meeting here today. Think about who they know. And when you walk out of this room, see a sense of opportunity and make a difference with one person. Or better yet, save one person individually. Not because you did a program that's going to improve tax collection across your whole country. No, one human being that you can shake their hand, that you can have breakfast with, that you can make a difference with. Because when you do that, when you take that action in this room here and now, now you're on the path to realizing this amazing future that Roger and Juan have laid out for you, and a future that I submit is already here, and is already happening, and the problem has already been solved. You, like a surfer, can get on the wave and make a difference. Thank you very much. when we're looking for opportunities to apply AI. Thank you. The fundamental part we have to understand with AI is that the secret lies in data. 10, 20 years ago, the majority of investments uh, went through software. Organizations purchased software and used the surf, uh, software. Today, the difference not the software, all companies, including Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Amazon, they're all giving the uh, AI tools for free. The tools that we use in Microsoft or that people use in Google or Facebook are all the same tools. And these tools, anyone around the world can download for free from the internet. Everything is open source. Why is this going on? Because the difference lies in the data. So if we have to look for a place to focus, where are the best opportunities? The opportunities are where we have problems that we can we solve with data, and we have the data. For instance, in the case of a bank, we already have the track record of all the loans the bank has provided, and we know which ones have defaulted or the customers have repaid. This information is already on the database at the bank. Using an AI tool on this on the data is relatively easy. What's difficult and the difficult part oftentimes is collecting the data and having data that we can rely on. So when focusing, focus on training people, uh, taking courses so that this uh, staff can be trained. When I entered Microsoft, Microsoft invested a lot of money on bringing in professors to teach us. Today, our development teams, AI teams, are being trained with these courses that are for free for anyone in the world. So training people today is for free, and it's just dedicating time to this. And again, the fundamental part of the business is knowing, is having data that we can rely on and investing on having quality data. And apart from having data that we can rely on is understanding what is it that we're looking for? Yes, fundamentally, it goes through understanding what problem we need to solve, what the risks of the problem are, and where are the data so that we can work on it. 
Roger, a question. Uh, the pieces of advice you can give to this audience. Thank you. Um, so some advice I would give. Uh, we actually did a, a bit of research at EY on the future of financial services. One of the things that we found is that a as AI takes hold, as automation takes hold, uh, individuals are going to be doing a lot more delegation of their decision to other systems. They're going to trust other people and other organizations to make decisions on their behalf. Uh, we call that the AI-driven financial operating system. Uh, we think that there's probably between 11 to $12 trillion worth of assets in play in that space where you can monetize the value of trust. So a big recommendation I would make for folks in the room to take action is we have to be bold in this space. We have to experiment on behalf of our constituents, on, the, on behalf of our employees, on behalf of our customers and clients, uh, and be bold and be ambitious because things that were impossible 10 years ago, 12 months ago, 30 minutes ago, are now possible today. So having that ambition and that continuous drive to test and learn, take experiments, do experiments, to find new value, that's going to be important going forward. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so one of the things that we found is that the, or, we did some research, and we're happy to share the report with the group. Uh, it's publicly available. Uh, what we're seeing is there is going to be a massive amount of change in financial services, but really around how we deliver financial services to people. What's not going to change are the people. People will stay the same. They're still going to have what we call the same moments that matter. Right? Graduating from school, getting your first job, buying a house, having children, uh, maybe buying a second home, going on a vacation, retiring, joining a country club. All of these are moments that matter in an individual's life. But the way that we're going to provide and support those moments as financial services institutions or as health institutions or as government institutions, that's all in play. That's all going to change. So. What we think is very much, uh, a lot of the data is pointing towards more subscription models, which I don't think should be a surprise for the folks in the room, but how those subscription models are actually going to be the convergence of multiple industries, including financial services, to serve those moments that matter. transformation project, what have been the complexities or issues you've found and what have been the successes? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I'll go back to some uh, personal examples. So does any one of you have one of these little devices with you today? Those. Right. And if ever, any of you ever used a, uh, a location-based service, a mapping like the one that I showed? Did you ever know what the origin story of that was? It was a conference room in Lyle, Illinois. Actually, no, it was my office. And we came in with a legal mandate from the FCC to do uh, wireless emergency communications. And instead, we created a commercial service, created six patents, and those did about $20 billion in US billion dollars in uh, revenue last year. That took us about a week to create that because it was a team that was working together the way that Juan and Roger talked about. Um, you've heard the word FinTech here. Roger had it on his slides. Anybody know the origin story of the very first FinTech product? It was in IBM Watson Labs 2002 when I led that. And it was a bunch of people using Agile before it was called Agile. We had a global team, Switzerland, the IBM Hursley Lab. I was in the IBM Watson Lab, some people from Japan as well, and then across. But to Roger's point about transformation, they set me up as a mini CEO with an internal board of directors so I could cut past all the garbage and get that out. And that project had been languishing for three years almost. We had clients breathing down our neck for it, and we got it out the door in about five months. 
and that led to this whole you know, thing that we find out there in the world today. So these are very, very easy to do. And then we've got some going with the IDB right now, where it's just about the will to organize the right way and, and think differently. Avoid the structural blindness, avoid the cognitive bias. And that's why these centers that Roger and Juan run are you know, like play school you know, for adults with tech toys. But bringing together domain experts with the mathematical knowledge, with the software knowledge to solve business problems. Because otherwise this stuff is useless and that's why we're wasting millions of dollars in machine learning because that connection is, is not made. And again, at breakfast, you know, Roger and Juan had some great examples that they haven't yet shared here. So very, very easy to do. It's about taking the first steps and anybody here today can do it before you walk out of the room. I've done it over and over and over again. audience in regards to the financial services. Yeah, so on the f uh, future of work, the difficulty with that whole literature is that it's based on a few studies that are using very high level data. Um, and uh, because it was what was available at global level. If you look at the lower level of data that's available from like the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, so you go to LinkedIn and Indeed and places like that, you see that what people are predicting actually already happened. And it happened decades ago, even in the official published data. Um, but we just group things together at two high levels. Like take, for example, uh, computing skills. That, you know, Ron this morning was talking about, you know, computing on a you know, machine where you had to play your storage device was a cassette tape. And Roger was talking about having a Commodore 64. Sorry, guys, I'm dating you, but I think I'm older than both of you. And <laughs> that has already changed. And that's why people should be sitting in the room thinking there is this enormous threat to your jobs because you've got people going all over that are taking these out. And this is every finance minister I talk to in an emerging market, whether it's in Latin America or whether it's in Eurasia or whatever, they're saying, yeah, we could implement all these great programs, but now we've got to lay off 300 people. What do we do? A company that I work with in Jamaica did a cloud solution like Roger and Juan talked about. They went from 40 people to two people. Those are huge changes. So these aren't things that are going to happen. They are things that are already happening. And when you do that in an emerging market country, there is huge instability. I'm Debbie, I know coming from Michigan, when you go from 100,000 workers to 6,000 workers, that was traumatic. And, in, and that's one plant. So this has already happened, and you need to understand the urgency which, which there is to act and to implement all these very good, very practical, very doable solutions. Yeah, so if I could add to what Brian said, one of the things that we're looking at is uh, everyone talks about the productivity gains that we're going to get from technology. Uh, the 10 times productivity, you've probably heard that 10x number quite a bit. It's been thrown out quite, quite a lot. Uh, the way that we look at it is if you're given 10 times productivity for all of your people, there's two things you can do. You can do everything that you're doing today with one tenth the people. And that's sure, certainly a good strategy in the short term. Or you can take all the people that you have and enable them to do 10 times as much. And in the long term, that growth strategy is the winning strategy. So the challenge for us is, how do we take that productivity and redeploy it so that all of our people can do 10 times as much? you have or have had any concern with artificial intelligence. Can you share something about it? Because of technology, any technology can be good, good or for the evil. And today, one of the examples of technology that will have a negative impact partially is that we've already seen in the last few years a it's because of what we call the system and understanding how algorithms here more than anything else.
próximo ano, próximo dois anos. Mesma. Para ver alguém na televisão, que é igual que o presidente Obama, por exemplo. is that we're going to have and see how this technology will be used to generate fake news. And this will generate trouble in our society. And we'll have to train society to be able to tell and find the way to tell whether what you're watching on TV, WhatsApp, or Facebook is true or not at a more difficult level than what we're looking at with fake news because this is going to look more real. take control of it, that homo sapiens may disappear. In this regard, I'm not so fatalist because these algorithms are mathematical. There is nothing conscious about algorithms, and this is something we need to understand. The only thing that happens is they seem intelligent because they process a large amount of data, but there's nothing to it. If you have to fear somebody, we ourselves as human beings using these algorithms, but we shouldn't be afraid from AI. AI is made to help us. Unfortunately, yes, it can be used just like any technology for something evil. But if we have to be afraid, we have to be afraid of ourselves. So what's important is to understand is that there are several myths that we have. a todos os we focus on how innovation and financial innovation can promote efficiency in the area of payments fund uh, funding insurance and this generates integrity in the financial system that's so important in our countries Thank you so much, and let's give a big hand for our panelists.